and uh, we have Dr. Borte in the background. We're also talking about the anxiety that comes um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, staying at home, the lockdown, um, having not having enough money to buy and stock up and all of that. And so, Dr. Borte, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing good, and yourself? I'm fine, thank you. I know that this is a very critical moment for health workers like you. And first of all, we'd like to say thank you to all of you, um, including yourself, for all the work that you're doing for us. But let's talk about anxiety and how it will set in for many people um, in this critical moment. First of all, I'm sure that the disease itself brings about a lot of anxious moments. Run us through some of the you know, um, issues that you have come across concerning the disease and people and how they're managing it. Well, thank you and then, uh, good morning to your viewers. Um, with this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, now that it's all over the place, it comes with expected anxiety. Yeah in every sphere of life, every walk of life. Um, uh, those at the front line especially, no doctor can say that he's very comfortable. Um, it's like you have been put in the front line of war, yeah, yeah. in the combat time. Um, same applies to people who are the citizenry, for, for that matter. Mm. Um, because the narrative over the time has been that it's a pandemic, and the, the numbers you hear are skyrocketing. Yeah. And I'm coming to think of the fact that um, I remember as at 4th of March, mm -hmm. um, uh, the number was around 95,000 confirmed yeah. cases. And just within three weeks down the line, We're almost uh, we at are a million. about 800,000 people yeah. um, down with uh, COVID-19. I mean, that, that would send shivers down the spine of any 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 rational human being, mm. including the health workers. The, the, the problem of, of COVID, not mainly because of this death rate, but the rate at which um, it, it spreads, its transmissibility, how contagious it is, um, that one can easily get it. I mean, you see health workers taking care of a sick person, and before long, they themselves are infected. And you, and you ask yourself, I mean, how did that happen? Even in the developed countries where you have um, Italian doctors, Spanish doctors, yeah. so many of them dying. And you realize that uh, for, even for them, they have quite um, a larger supply of, of, of protective equipment or protective um, wares than we do. Okay. And they are coming down with the disease. Now, you, you will definitely be anxious. You go home for after work, um, even though you, you may not have come into contact and um, your family, everybody is looking at you, please go and bath mm -hmm. before you touch anything in the house. I mean, you, you are like a stranger in your own home. Um, it brings worry, even to the children. Um, they will ask you, Daddy, uh, we have heard about Corona. Do, do you have it? Yeah. <laughs> you, oh, they actually like, ask you that, whether you yes, have it? The kids, yeah, kids these days, they read a lot, so <laughs> they, they, they have all kinds of knowledge. Yeah. And again, because of the kind of narrative going on around, um, everybody is on their alert. Everybody sees his uh, friend as a suspect. Mm -hmm. So now you are walking and you are looking over your shoulders if anybody is within a meter or two radius from you. Um, yeah. you, you look at people and, well, um, you may not be showing signs, but you could be incubating. Not to and, cut you, but that, would you say that the media is also adding up to the anxiety? They're saying spread, um, you know, uh, calm, not fear. At the same time, we're also believing that if we put out the numbers as it is, then maybe people will be a bit more cautious as to adhering to the social distancing rules and all of that. And so then it, it keeps us put. But at the same time, a lot of people are also saying that if we're constantly putting out the numbers, in relation to those who are infected, those who have died, then it spreads more panic. Yes, um, I, I, I think that the media has also played a, a good role in terms of it, trying to educate people, trying to create awareness. Mm. And uh, that's a good one. Um, the other side of it is that the numbers that are being put out, it's more like um, a one-sided kind of picture being okay. created um, all the time. I mean, if you look at, and, and so it's also affecting the citizenry. I'll come to peculiar cases that have come to hospitals because people are now flocking to the hospital, not because they have corona, mm. but actually a lot of people are coming with panic disorders, anxiety disorders. Yeah. And I mean, to the extent that, you know, we, as much as we are preaching, wash your hands regularly, um, sanitize your hands, don't touch surfaces and all these things. Mm. It's good. I mean... If people would understand it from the point that, look, these are things that 
we are supposed to have been doing normally every day. If you go to a toilet, wash your hands. Yeah. If you if you touch anything, wash your hands. If you touch money, do well to touch your hands. Even when we're not in the time of COVID, mm. if we do if we, if we did this regularly, this will not be like any strange thing to us now. It's yeah. just like become a little bit more frequent. Mm -hmm. Let me say that people are even could get to the point of even washing their hands every ten seconds. Yeah. If it happens like that, then as much as it is good, it could also be that the person is now possibly going into what is something you call um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Exactly. So you are working your washing your hands and sanitizing your hands not out of um, out of the the, 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 the hygiene sense, yeah. but out of certain psychological fear that if I don't do this, if I don't do that, it's good that we do that, and I would recommend that we wash our hands as frequently as possible. Mm -hmm. But it should be that. I'm doing this as a regular thing that I need to do to keep healthy or to keep myself hygienic, okay. but not based on an obsession or compulsion, which can actually affect a person's psyche. Mm. Now, coming back to coming back to the numbers, um, for example, when when I for how this is how people I think people should look at this whole thing. Um, I look at the numbers, and it's eight hundred and something thousand people yeah. um, around the world infected. Mm -hmm. Now, you can look at the number of people who are dead, and I think... It's about 42,000 worldwide. It's about, it's about 22,000 42, right? 42,000. 42,000. Yeah. Yes. So you can look at it, and then it, it, it just generates the fear. It's okay. But you see, in these times, um, we are not in normal times. Mm. This, there must be a lot of psychologists working and, and helping people overcome the fear and the panic and the anxiety. We are all trying to spread the calm. Yeah. But one way that we can also look at it is, okay, now, what about the number of people who have recovered? Mm -hmm. Are people recovering? Okay. And can I compare this to the fatality rate of uh, Ebola? Okay. How many Ebola clients or patients were dying mm -hmm. compared to mm -hmm. um, um, COVID-19? I mean, if you look at, compare some of these statistics, at least there's a glimmer of hope that, okay. well, at least in this case, so far we are seeing a mortality rate of about 4.5%. So it means that at least there are 95% there right? of chances of, 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 of being alive, okay. even okay. in the, in the um, unlikely circumstance that anyone got it. Now, so for me, I, I, I would look at the statistics and I look at the active cases and I tell myself, okay, these are the active cases in the world. They are about 600,000. Um, the critical cases are about maybe 20,000. They yeah. are in hospitals. Mm. Okay, so problem is with the mild cases who are active and they are working in the communities. Mm -hmm. We are working, can we do something about this? This is what we are working on. Then All I right. looked also at the closed cases. Closed cases are the cases that um, there's a verdict. Either yeah. you are dead or oh. you have recovered. Mm. And you realize that of the closed cases too, you have about, I'm sure close to about... Thousands of one, people have recovered, yeah. People. Yes, 175,000 people who have also recovered. At least, so if you want to look at it, then you look at it as, okay, the glass is not half empty, mm. but the glass is also half full. So depending on what kind of eye you, you use to look at these statistics, it gives you a glimmer of hope or it can actually melt you down totally because you are just considering the fact that so many people are dying. Yes, it's a pandemic and... and um, a few All more right. people are likely to go down. Now, now what about, sorry, but what about the situation where they're asking people to get tested? I don't mean here, but the WHO now is advocating for us to test, test, test. Unfortunately, here in Ghana, we're now even starting the mandatory testing in some municipalities. And so it's not widespread. And there are so many people who, out of fear, have started identifying some symptoms. So you wake up one morning, you have a headache. The next morning, you have a cold. And you don't have the opportunity to test. You're not sure, you know, whether you actually have it or not. How do I deal with that kind of anxiety as well? Knowing very well that it could turn out positive or negative, but it's probably just my mind, you know. How do I manage that situation? Yes, I mean, this how, simply this is how you need to manage that. I know now it's very difficult for even people to cough in public. Yeah. yeah. Somebody came and asked if there's a, a medicine that they can take look at so that they can cough in the reverse direction. <laughs> and cough and okay. Back. <laughs> because the, the mere, just one cough and somebody feels that I have COVID. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what I want to say is that before COVID, people were coughing. Mm -hmm. Before COVID, there were sore throats. 
Before COVID, there were there were people who were sneezing. People have already already have underlying conditions like sinusitis that they sneeze every morning yeah. regularly. I mean, I mean reaction to things in the environment. So a cough at that time never meant COVID. A cough at that time, a sneeze at that time never suggested anybody COVID. had coronavirus. Yeah. So we are not, we are saying that yes, the signs of corona, um, people should get it really clearly. Over the time, um, the studies done so far on the so many patients gotten, they educate educate yourself on the fact that it actually starts with a fever. Okay. Most of the time, it's with a fever, and then a week later, a cough, oh, and I then see. later on, um, you have. Um, shortness of breath and difficulty in breathing coming in. Mm -hmm. So the mere fact that you coughed once and it's not repetitive should not um, make you fear or have that anxiety that because I just coughed once, sometimes I can even choke on something and then it, 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 the reaction is a cough. Yeah. Um, shouldn't mean that because I coughed once or I sneezed once, yesterday I sneezed. Mm. <laughs> but I don't have a fever, I don't Doc. have a cough. And it was just one. <laughs> Are you sure you're fine? Should I step back, <laughs> social distancing, <laughs> maybe? It's just a one-time thing, um, and maybe because of an environment you were in. Yeah. Now, if people understand the the the, the, the trajectory of this condition, you won't just associate just any cough with okay. um, but with uh, with COVID. With COVID, in any yes. Case, it's good that we are now implementing um, a way of trying to test it more. Yeah. The more we test, the more we are going to have cases. Now, people have anxiety too when it comes to the testing. Um, some people have been to, I, I had a case where somebody just went to the market, mm -hmm. a health help went to the market and got back home. Mm. And as soon as she got back home in the house, she just stood there and said she can't breathe well. Oh. Meanwhile, before going to the market, she was fine and everything. Okay. So they said, ah, so I was called. And I'm like, well, if the person cannot breathe, uh, is the person asthmatic? They said no. Mm. What happened? So oh, she just came back from the market. Uh, so the mere fact that the person went to a crowded area, yeah, and with yeah. the COVID at the back of her mind, maybe I could have um, got in touch with somebody. Maybe I may be having Corona, and um, just because I went to the market. But mm -hmm. if the person knows that, or if you know that, even getting in touch with somebody with Corona doesn't give immediate symptoms, right? Then, then there's yeah. an incubation yeah. period. You realize that. It's, it's not it. So I asked them, bring the person to the hospital. When they told the person we are taking you to the hospital, it didn't make the matters worse. Oh. Whilst on the way to the hospital, they called again. Doc, she just collapsed in the car. I said, still bring her in. So they brought her in and we sorted her out. Everything was fine. She, oh. she was awake and everything was, I mean, mm. she's been discharged. She had no temperature. She had no sores with nothing. It was just a mere fact that I went into the midst of people. And because yeah. of the narrative, yeah don't go into the midst of people because of that narrative it has generated a psychosomatic symptom what we call mind over body um, symptomatology okay, and it, okay. the body needs to act in that way several people have come to the hospital in these times and the complaint is about that in the night they just wake up and they said my heart is beating my heart mm -hmm. is beating i mm -hmm. can't and they are rushed to the hospital all because of the narrative going on yeah. so we can we can find another way of packaging it i mean just yesterday we heard that Ghana's cases have, have we've had about 36 or so. About 31, recovery. yeah, people, um, you so, know, had been discharged. Yeah, so there is a glimmer of hope somewhere, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. So we, sh we should start also getting telling people that even if you get it, remain calm. Okay. It does not mean so many people have become exposed worldwide. So many, I'm sure some doctors have become exposed. Uh, well, we have, have quite a exposed. number of healthline workers who unfortunately have even lost their lives as a result. Yes. And that's also as causing even more fear as well. Yes. And so and, then and, I'm bringing, let's come to the health workers and how you are also dealing with it. I mean, it's understandable that you may understand um, some of the issues that come with Corona, but having to be at the front line, that obviously comes with its own psychological complications as well. Run us through that and how you uh, and your team are able to manage that while still taking care of the sick. Yes, I mean, you are taking care of sick people and you're also supposed to maintain social distance. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, if you go to certain hospitals, um, a lot of people are trying to do uh, distance kind of consultation. Okay. Um, either on telephone or something, if there's a need to, for you to come to the hospital, you speak to the doctor first, if there's really the need for you to come to the hospital, it will ask you to come. Um, even in the consulting rooms now, chairs have been moved a bit further away from yeah. the doctor, so that, I mean, there's that minimum of two meter gap 
and then um, where the doctor needs to examine the patient, as in physically touching, then you need to at least wear the minimum protection, not yeah. just um, the fact that you are suspecting somebody with COVID, but if you are going to examine somebody now, maybe hitherto you never wore gloves in examining people, you never wore well, a mask. You have to, At this yeah. time, you have to put all those things in place. Once you are going to examine a patient, touch somebody, you need to wear gloves, disposable gloves, after which you just dispose of, of them immediately. And then, and it's in, in a lot of times, um, ideally, a doctor should be um, cleaning the handles of their doors, doors more frequently, or ideally, be opening the door yourself for, for clients. Is there don't fear to come in. more about <laughs> losing your life or contracting the virus and taking it back home and infecting your family? Yes. What really I is mean, the it's fear? About, it's, it's about that too, because now you are not alone. Once you, you know, the, the issue that happened in Colibu, the suspected case yeah. of the one from, is it Dallas or Texas or something in the U.S. Mm. in uh, the Guinea ward? Yes, that evening when the suspicion came, a lot of the doctors couldn't go home. Wow. They had to sleep in their cars that night, the whole night, until the results came out to oh tell that. God. Because the, the thing is so contagious that you take it home and, and you pass it on. You have just spread it to other people. You probably, as a doctor, you, sometimes you think, well, this is a, a do and die job. Mm -hmm. you, are, you are on the front line. It's like, just like a soldier. Who has taken an oath that anything can happen in the on the at the war front, yeah. but your family shouldn't suffer same. So you are home, and even when your kids are coming close to you, you feel you, have, you feel like telling them, "Don't come Don't close." Don't come. To me. There was a video of a doctor who got home. His son was running to him, and he had to stop his son, and then he broke down crying. Because yes. this is something they do on a daily after work, yes. and he couldn't even exactly. do that. They hug you all the time, and all of you just tell them, "Don't come close. Don't." And they, after that, maybe after that, you try to do all the sanitizing of yourself. You yeah. take your bath and everything. And when they come close to you, you feel like telling them, "Go to your room. Don't." And it's a very difficult time. It's a very difficult time. Wow, this 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 must be hard. Um, but also, let me ask about stigmatization. If we're talking about anxiety, then obviously that also leads to the issue of trying to keep people at bay. But are we not overdoing it at this point in the sense that we're even scared of our own family members now? Um, should we at least embrace them and allow them to come close or should we still maintain the social distancing? Well, the social distancing is something we should ensure that we, we keep, but we should not stigmatize. Okay. The mere fact that anybody even tests positive doesn't mean that we should stigmatize everybody around them. Again, mm. we should also start creating hope that, just like we have said so far, um, um, stigma against HIV, I don't know how far it's gone, but hopefully it's coming down because we keep telling people that at least now there is treatment, yeah. you can live a normal life with HIV and blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing. If we can also change the narrative or the rhetoric a bit to say that, oh, even in the dire direst circumstances in the in the unlikely event that you get it there, there's good treatment for you you can okay. recover and definitely the the people who are more at risk in terms of the statistics in the in the in the in the death zone and the elderly the people yeah. who have comorbid factors like hypertension cardiovascular mm -hmm. diseases cancers they they, they succumb more to, yeah. to the condition we can we should still create hope in the in the environment okay. even for a person on their dying bed when doctors know that it's all ended we still give the person hope a little you know mm. we suck the person up positively so the the psyche of the the citizenry is so much in the negative all right if we can do something to um opti bring it to a, a point of optimism yeah. than the pessimism and it would also go a long way to help so that right. we don't stigmatize. Thank the you so much. And the panic is so high. Thank you so much, Dr. Borte. It's been a pleasure speaking to you this morning on TV3 New Day, and he's from Health Net Swan Medical Center, talking to us about the anxiety associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, starting today from 10 to 11.30 a.m., we're coming your way with a 360 discussion um, of COVID-19. We'll be speaking to people from other countries, trying to find out what's happening in those countries in relation to the number of cases, um, lockdown issues, and all of that. And we'll also take a deeper look at what really is happening here in our country as well. We'll be hosting by myself and Anita Akufu. And so make sure that you stay tuned into TV3 all day so we keep updating you. It's still TV3 New Day.